All right, so uh, I'm going to start with an apology, because uh, this is the title of the talk um, that you've all seen, although the actual content of the talk is a little different. It's categories and how to delete 96% minus epsilon <laughs> of your code. So hopefully, uh, you know, a little bit more ambitious, um, but uh, is, would it be nice to be able to delete 96% of your code, right? I feel like that'd be really helpful. Um, so who am I? Uh, I'm, as mentioned, I'm Greg File. I work at Formation, which we're hiring. Uh, we like Scala people. Um, we like FP leaning Scala people especially, but we will help you lean FP if necessary. Um, and uh, I work with a bunch of people you may be familiar with, uh, Ross Baker, uh, Chris McKinley who gave a talk earlier this conference, uh, Chris Nuttycomb is a well-known speaker as well, and Paul Snively who is here and is giving a talk in this room at 3 p.m. That's the right time, right? All right, so come to that one too. Um, and yeah, so, uh, so people who know me may know me from my work with recursion schemes and talks I've given on recursion schemes. Um, the common question I get now is uh, where are the turtles, which refers to the name of the library I didn't finish, which is a, a recursion schemes library for cats. But thankfully, Andy Scott has picked up my slack and he wrote a recursion schemes library for cats uh, called Drost, and uh, so you can check that out. I'm technically a contributor, but I haven't actually done anything there, so. Um, <laughs> Also, uh, Valentin Casas and I have been working on a uh, recurrent schemes cookbook to kind of, uh, you know, answer real world questions that people have about like why they might want to use them or what to do in different cases and stuff like that. So hopefully that's helpful for people who are trying to get into the idea. Uh, this talk is not about recursion schemes, but it will use them a bit as an example. Um, this talk is also a uh, literate Scala presentation. Uh, so this is the SBT build that builds this talk. Um, so it works. Uh, the kind of stuff that's required is it needs a type level compiler, uses higher kinds, kind polymorphism, which is a very experimental feature uh, that's only available in type level or Dottie, um, and it uses cats and kind projector. Uh, are people familiar with kind projector? Yeah, yeah. It, it makes some, some type level syntax a little bit nicer, and it's kind of extremely useful if you're doing any kind of FP stuff in Scala. Uh, and imports are just a bunch of cats imports. So that's, that's everything you need to do what's in this talk. Um, so to begin, uh, as everything that I do involves, we start with a little kata. Um, kata is the, uh, the Greek word for algebra, basically. Um, they, basically, kata means to, uh, to collapse something down, uh, and an algebra means to reunite pieces, right? That's what an algebra is, is like combining pieces in various ways. So they're, they're basically the same thing, uh, just they're different languages. Um, so what, what is a kata? A kata is a generalization of, uh, of fold R, basically. If you're familiar with uh, the foldable type class and anything, um, you have this, this notion of uh, you know, taking something that basically fold R is very specific to lists. You can think you implement foldable for lots of different types, right? But really what foldable does is it forces you to throw away any additional information and treat your structure as effectively a list of elements. Um, and, uh, and so this generalizes it so you can actually kind of fold arbitrary tree structures down. Um, so fold R is, is the specialization of this to list. And so what this does is this takes two types, right, in this, this type, this is a type class. Um, so it takes two types that have some relationship to, between each other. And that relationship is defined by this, this function kata. Again, fold R, uh, basically. And so what it does is it takes some function that takes that F type and you know, gives you some, some result from processing that, that functor, uh, and then can turn that into a function that processes the t-type and returns you to a. So uh, to give you a simple example of, of what this is actually useful for, um, I kind of try to pick the simplest thing, which is basically natural numbers. Um, so natural numbers, there's a zero case, right? And then you can have a, su a successor of some other natural number. And so as, at the top there, you can see the examples. The zero is just zero and uh, successor, successor, successor of zero is three, right? Very simple uh, recursive structure, right? This is a self-referential structure. Um, and, uh, and so we can define this kind of, we can just say that it's recursive. Um, and, and the way we do it is we associate that natural type with the option functor. Um, and so in this case, right, you can kind of just squint a little bit, you see that none and zero are basically the same thing. And successor and sum are the same thing, except in sum, you have a type parameter where that natural is. So you're kind of removing the recursion from that structure. An option is the same as natural where it's not um, recursive in itself. Um, and so, so this is the definition. Well, you know, I kind of elided that part. But, but you can do this for any kind of recursive structure, whether it's a list or arbitrary tree structures, um, JSON, things like that. 
Um, and here's a simple implementation of how you would use kata. You would handle the two separate cases, effectively zero and successor, um, saying what to do in each case, and then it would apply it over the full natural number and give you, you know, the result. Um, so this is just to give you an idea of what kata does. It's, it's really not that important for the talk, um, but you have some context. So again, we just have this kata to start with. So you make a nice library. It has just this one function. Now you can define these, you know, these folds for any, any kind of interesting types, and you have this nice little library. Uh, then people are like, well, if I can take this thing and like, you know, collapse these structures down to some value, maybe I can do something that can build up tree structures for me. It's like, oh yeah, that's a good idea. We can, we can add sort of this other function uh, called Anna. Sorry for the Greek names, but uh, that's what they tend to be called. Uh, that, that builds up arbitrary tree st structures. It's like, yeah, these two things fit together, right? These belong in the same library. This is a, a reasonable bit of code. So now, you know, now we've like gone from Kata, we've added Anna, we have a, a slightly bigger library, and it's nice because these things feel symmetrical, right? You get this, uh, this extra bit of, um, I don't know, it just, it just feels like a, a complete library kind of, right? Like these things belong together. Oh, and then people start wanting to do other things. Um, so you have this, this catamorphism, and then somebody says like, well, you know, I really, ha I have this thing that's kind of like a catamorphism. Um, sorry, all these words have kata at the end, or sorry, I have morphism at the end, so kata is short for catamorphism, and paramorphism. So they're like, oh, I have this fold I want to do, but in my case, I need to kind of look at that original tree structure as I go through. I need to maintain that in some way. And there's a variation called a paramorphism that does that. Or somebody comes along and says like, oh, well, I kind of need to see like some of the results I've previously calculated along the way of traversing this structure and be able to, to use those again in later, like, later computations. And that's this histomorphism, where histo is short for history, where you get you know, the history of all the things you've calculated along the way. Um, and so these are different variations, and you know, it's like, okay, cool, yeah, I've, I've made this family of stuff. And for each of these variations, there's another variation on Anna. So you end up with, you know, you now have this kind of grid of these operations. And again, they all fit together. They all have similar shapes, and they all have these relationships. Um, and your library is getting a little bit bigger. It's starting to feel like maybe, yeah, it is justified that it's its own library and not just like added to cats, right? And then someone says, this is the one that comes up all the time. It's like, oh, well, I want to do this, but I want to have a monad on my you know, result, basically. Have, yeah, everybody's using monads and, like, and they're everywhere. And, and so they're like, oh, okay, well, yeah, I guess we can have a monadic version of this where the, uh, the function that's passed in re returns something in a monad, and therefore the resulting function returns something in a monad. So now, once again, you have your um, another another level, right, of uh, of things, and it's getting it's getting deeper. And you're like, oh, okay, cool, yeah, this is definitely a significant piece of work. This this project, it's uh, it's something. And and you know, as you as you add these things, every time you want to add one thing, right, you're now adding like a family of like four things. You're like, oh, okay, I have to add all four vari variations on this thing. And then more stuff comes along, and people are like, um, oh, well, you know, I have this recursive structure, but only certain things are allowed at certain points in the recursion. I want to like restrict, like say you have a, you're representing some language and you have an if construct. You want to make sure the first argument that if construct is something that represents a Boolean in some form. And so you want to restrict what structure can be in there and things like that. So that adds in these other kinds of, of recursive structures. And we don't have to care about what they are too much, but that's you know, one of the things they allow. And so now we have, you know, okay, now <laughs> we've got another dimension. And th this, this one goes off the side of the screen. There's a third, a third one of these. And now, again, it's like, oh, OK. Oh, I had some new idea I want to add to it. Now I have to add like 24 variations on that thing. And it's getting exhausting to keep all these things in sync across like files that are getting larger and larger. And, um, and yeah, and there's way more, right? So it, it goes beyond just this, like, this level of stuff. And uh, Quickly, there's just this thing called Elgot algebras that add another level of duplication. There's uh, dealing with homonad and monadic transformers as well, which add another level of duplication. So all these things, right? Each one of them like doubles the size of this library, and it's definitely feeling like a really significant piece of code now. <laughs> like, um, and so how do we how do we take this like massive thing that doesn't fit on the screen, and uh, and try to get it back to something that that is reasonable, basically. And, uh, and so that's, you know, that's what I'm trying to do here is, is, is show how we can use these things that maybe we think of as, you know, as too abstract, category theory and, and things like that, and like how we can actually apply those ideas uh, to you know, eliminate tons and tons of, of effectively duplicated code. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so let's see. So the first thing we can talk about is, is earlier we saw, you know, there's those variations we talked about in here, which is like there's histo, kata, and the one at the bottom, the para is kind of cut off. Um, those are different variations that give you different kind of extra information as you're folding something. 
And it turns out like all those structures are, um, are comonads, right? So cofree is a comonad. Uh, this tuple at the bottom for para is a comonad. Um, and so you're like, well, maybe there's something we can do. We can like add a comonad constraint and just like, you know, eliminate all of those and treat them all the same way. And, and caddy, you can kind of think of as having identity, the identity comonad there, which is like the no-op of, uh, of comonads and monads. Um, and so like, maybe there's some way we can just like abstract over, over comonad, right? This is something we do all the time, right? Uh, if you're doing functional programming, you see these commonalities and you're like, oh, this, the operations we're using on this are just from this like subset, you know, or some, from some abstraction. And we can like identify that and replace our concrete types with a type parameter that maybe has some constraint on it. And so that's what we'd like to do here. It's a little bit more complicated than that in this case, but not much. Um, so we have this new thing called a gcata, the generalized cata, which adds a you know, w, which has a comonad um, constraint on it. And so, um, and so you know, hopefully we can do this thing. But we actually had to add one other little piece, which is sort of a generalization of sequence, if you're familiar with the, um, the traverse class. But it, um, it, this, this allows it to be a bit broader than requiring the particular types of, uh, of traverse. So basically now at GCAT, you have to pass in some way to swap uh, your functor and your, your comonad. And so with this, this extra parameter, though, we now have these types um, here is like kata is just using identity and ID. Um, the histo is using cofree, and it passes this distributed function for uh, cofree. And the paramorphism is the same thing for a distributed function for, for tuples. Uh, and so now we've gotten, you know, collapsed all these into this one definition. So if you provide these, you can do it just as an alias, basically, rather than redefining things. And so you know, this is what we had before, and now we've managed to kind of like collapse that vertical, right? And so now, now we've like, oh, we've, we've shrunk this, like, this painful part of our library. We now have uh, a more manageable uh, set of things. And I only have to like, you know, re-implement like eight things when I change something. So great, we've made some progress. And I, this is just restacks it. So this is the same thing as, as on this slide, um, but makes it fit better. So what else can we do? Well, this is where we start getting into the category theory stuff. A little bit, a little bit. Uh, so previously, we just abstracted over some, some data type we had, right? And we, we lifted it up to a type parameter and gave it some constraint. Um, and we can do that same thing some more. In this case, we abstract over something that, that maybe people aren't familiar, as familiar with abstracting over, um, which is functions themselves, right? So we, we have this recursive um, uh, type that, that uses functions, right? f of a to a and t to a. And we have the, the, sorry, the monadic Cleisley variant, which does the same thing with monads there. Um, and what we'd like to do is abstract over what that arrow is in between everything. And a function is just a type like anything else, right? We often don't think of it that way. We think of functions as kind of more, more primitive things, but really they're not. And so we can lift that function into the type parameter just the same way here, right? So this just, and that's a valid identifier. It's just like a long Unicode arrow. Um, and the, so this is just saying, for whatever kind of function-like thing we specialize to, uh, we define an f of a to a and a t of a with that new abstracted notion of a function. Uh, and then here's where we specialize it. Again, these are just type aliases, right? And again, this all compiles. This is like, which actually surprises me that some of the things in this talk compile. Um, so if we specialize it to function one, which function one is just the way we can refer to that regular arrow. Um, this is part of Scala, um, the standard library. So if we specialize it with function one, we get back our original recursive type with that kata. Um, but if we specialize it with this other thing that is function-like but has a monad in it uh, called a Cleisley arrow, um, this gives us now a way to, to get kata m um, just by specializing on Cleisley instead of on function. And so what this does is it says an arrow from, say, t to a, um, this arrow actually has an m on it, so it ends up being t to m of a if that makes sense. So the, the, the monad context, the monadic context is actually part of the arrow, not part of the result type. Um, and it's just, a, it's just a matter of, um, of basically Cleisley itself. I mean, it's not defined as an alias, but it could just be an alias over, um, you know, say like A to M of B. And, uh, and it works like this. And so you can substitute in that Cleisley um, just as you would use function one here, and you get the, the monadic variance out. And so now we, we've done it, you know, we, we had this, and now we can see we have those monadic variants. And on the other side, these are comonadic variants, which, um, you know, I don't have to get into the details on that stuff. But now we can, like, collapse that whole dimension forward, and we have a nice smaller thing, right? And we're, we still have all the generality we had, right? But because we've moved these things to type parameters, we don't actually have to implement, like, 
a billion different things. So our library is getting much more reasonable and much more manageable again. And now here, here's the original title of the talk, which talks about duality. Um, and so we had that recursive, and we talked about Anna, which is this kind of you know, symmetrical thing, right? Where before we were folding things down, and Anna is building things up from things. Um, and it turns out there's actually, as we, we had talked about before, abstracting over these categories, right? Uh, which is those function arrows. Uh, so there's a special kind of arrow called op, or the opposite category, um, which given some category and its objects, right? Uh, so types and on both sides, it returns the opposite of that, reversed, right? So if you, if you have function one, you have an arrow from A to B, and that's the same thing as A arrow B. If you did the opposite of function one, A to B, you now have a function B to A, right? All it does is switch that, that function. So now it's saying that it's required to receive a, uh, a function in the, uh, you know, has the arguments in the opposite order, or has the argument and result, domain and codomain in the opposite order. So we can use that and actually define here the dual. We can define type rec uh, the co-recursive, the opposite operation. We can define as a type alias, saying like whatever that type is, whatever that category is, just give me the, the same thing for the opposite category. So now you've defined all those other operations that are like dual to, to folds, unfolds, um, just through this type alias, basically. Now this introduces one particular problem, uh, one of the classic problems in computer science, the problem of naming. <laughs> so what, what is the anamorphism called when you do this? It's called kata, <laughs> which is not what people expect. <laughs> and when you see that in code, when someone like has something dot kata and they fold, like, oh, this is folding, wait, no, this is totally not folding anything. <laughs> So this is a, a problem I haven't solved other than to say like you don't really do type aliases in this case. You try to like, you know, basically extend and rename everything and like give those correct, give those opposite names. But man, I spent so much time trying to figure out how do I find names that uh, are both a thing and the opposite of that thing. It's a really, really hard class of thing to find names for. Um, it really keeps me up at night. Like, there's got to be some way to just like, you know, co cat I guess. We gotta, but yeah, I don't know. You need one name for both. Uh, it's, Inflammable, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Flammable and inflammable. That's the opposite. That's the opposite words that both mean the same thing. I need one word that means two different things. Um, yeah, and so with, with this duality, we managed to collapse these, these you know, two sets of things down. And now we've gotten down to just one nice, small, like, okay, our library is getting small again. Maybe it should just be part of cats. Who knows? Um, and so, so the last thing I'm going to talk about is, uh, is kind polymorphism. Uh, this looks totally un unifiable in any kind of you know, way that Scala provides, right? Like, if you look at the first one, that's our regular kata that we've been working with, abstracted over the category. In this one, there's like all the shapes of the parameters have all changed, right? And in this one too, the shapes of all the parameters have changed. We have like no way to like say that these things are the same shape. So we do actually, thanks to, to um, Pascal Votto and, uh, and Miles Sabin, they have added what's called kind polymorphism, where you're basically saying there's some parameter here I don't care what the shape of it is. And the shape of it will be kind of at least constrained, not fixed entirely, but constrained by how these things are used together. Like f of a, the shape of a has to fit into the shape of f there. Like those things have to align. And that'll be, that'll be verified. Like you can't just throw arbitrary kinds everywhere and have them not line up. Um, but this allows you to abstract over those shapes. And so now you can define this one function that actually works for the uh, you know, the, the uh, regular case and this, this mutual recursive case and this type aligned case and, and other things that have different shapes. And so now we've taken this and we've gotten back to a library that is just kata. And that's the only thing you need. Um, and so this is actually what it looks like when you put it all together. It's not as pretty. It adds a few extra things, but this has all the abstractions all combined into one thing. Um, it's a little, a little messy, but it's, it's one function. Um, but there are problems with this, <laughs> not to, uh, <laughs> um, the compiler support is not great yet, especially, I mean, like even using type level, there's things that you can't, can't really get on. Um, and then, uh, it breaks type inference like crazy, way too many type parameters, way too many other things. Um, so often in practice you do end up specializing and like giving those other names back. But again, you just define them as aliases that have like partially applied to type parameters. So you don't have to like redefine the operations again. Um, and then, uh, uh, library support, like some of this stuff requires different, slightly different definitions of things like functors and stuff like that, not what you would expect from like cats or Scala Z. And so there's, there's differences there. Um, there's a compile time cost for resolving all these things. And finally, you know, you look at this and this is not what you show to some, 
new Scala FP introduct D, right? You're like, oh, here, just implement this thing. Um, so there's a cognitive load to, like, to, to presenting things this way. But really, in the end, uh, all you need is a kata. This is not my arm, I promise. Um, but, <laughs> but it is a friend of mine, uh, Valentin Casas, who, uh, who literally got tattooed that the only thing you need is a kata after, after realizing this fact for himself that everything comes down to this. Um, so yeah, so thank you um, for listening. And thanks to all of these uh, people for, for various um, things and contributions. Uh, and my slides are available there at the bottom. I mean, the compile time costs, well, <laughs> with the Scala code bases I've worked with, this is not that significant of a compile time cost. But I would say for other Scala co code bases, it might seem a, a significant compile time cost. But most of the stuff is actually resolved and sorted out of compile time and doesn't affect uh, runtime. Uh, like kind, this kind polymorphism stuff, for example, which is kind of the biggest piece, um, is totally erased um, during compile time. Yeah, yeah, there was a, there was, that was the kind of the introduction of the, I maybe didn't say it clearly. Whoa, what did I do there? Um, where do we get into here? It was after this. Yeah, when I first introduced categories here, the idea was that you could use function one or Cleisley as your, oh, I, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Questions? Oh. <laughs> Seth. Um, does there exist a, Uh, no, this is so. This is actually compiles with um, with type level Scala on two twelve. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Great. Thank you. So much. <laughs>